So at 14, there was nothing more important to me in life than the Sega Dreamcast. Not even Jesus Christ at the time. This was the main thing in my life. And if you don't know what a Sega Dreamcast is, it was a video game console that made the N64 look like a baby's toy. And my brother and I were determined that we were going to get this thing. We saved every penny that we had in order to purchase this console. But my allowance was $2 and his allowance a week. $2 a week and his allowance was $1.25 a week. And when we figured it all up, it was going to take us over a year to save up for the $200 that it took to buy the Sega Dreamcast. So we didn't have that long to wait. We didn't have that much patience. So we were going to have to get a job. And so we got a job with my grandmother who owned a children's consignment store. And people would bring in like old toys they wanted to sell and make money on. But they were nasty and disgusting. So my grandma would uh, send them outside to us. And we would scrub them with brushes, Ajax, and Clorox. All in like 120 degree weather in uh, coastal South Carolina humidity that makes... It was bad. It was like an, you felt like you were like living in an armpit. It was real bad. And, and I remember just wanting to just, just if I passed away in that moment, it was going to be okay. And I, I looked at my brother, and my brother and I would look at each other as we're scrubbing and thinking to ourselves, this is for the Dreamcast. This is for the Dreamcast to encourage each other. And after a couple of months through the summer, we finally earned enough money to get this Dreamcast. And because we actually worked so hard for it, getting this game console was even sweeter. And the reason we were able to endure that heat was because we had a future hope in our lives that we were aiming toward, a goal that we were going toward. Now, that's a silly example. And you probably have similar things as a kid, things that you saved up for, whatever it may be. But hope is powerful. It can help us make it through anything there's a hope that Peter talks to us in his book that we looked at last week, a living hope that is eternal and will empower us to endure all that life throws at us. Now, Peter, as he talks about pain, we, we think of Peter, maybe you've seen um, stained glass or statues of Peter, and he looks like this, this great figure with a tall hat and maybe a staff, and he looks more like Gandalf than he does probably what he actually looked like because he was a, uh, he was, he, he was a fisherman who uh, probably wasn't trained, and even his book was probably written by someone else as he spoke it to them because he m may have not even known how to write. Which is why First Peter is such a beautifully written book. He actually mentions um, who probably wrote it for him, and it's probably Silas of Paul and Silas fame who wrote this book on his behalf as he spoke it to them. But he was, he, he was no stranger to enduring pain. He endured emotional pain as he saw his best friend, Jesus Christ, go to the cross, the one that he had put all his hope and faith in. He watched him die, not knowing, as we know, we have the spoiler to the story that he rises from the dead. He doesn't know that Jesus is going to rise from the dead. He thinks it's over and done with. He endured that pain. And pain also that caused him to deny his Savior. Peter then goes on to, after Jesus dies and is buried and resurrects and then ascends into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. Peter goes on to be be the, uh, one of the most important people in the early church who G Jesus says he will build his church on. And during that time, things weren't great. He faced harsh persecution for his faith. Eventually, Peter would go on to be crucified, but only after he watched his wife crucified upside down. And so he writes this letter to a group of Christians that understood Persecution, a group of Christians that understood what it was to be an outsider, to be rejected and persecuted because they were so different from the society around them. And Peter calls this difference of the Christian being in exile. And he says this isn't just the path for churches in 60 AD, but it is the path for all Christians throughout time, that even though we are in different circumstances and we're not facing harsh consequences like many of those Christians were in Peter's day, we still are exiles in this world. We are different. We are just passing through. Our true home is in heaven and here. We, we've set up a, a, a time where we, um, we invest in our community and we love those around us and all of those things, but we truly understand and we long to be back at our home in heaven. 
And so, we need a hope to empower us through this time. And that's what Peter talks about here. So we're going to read 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 3. It'll be up on the screen. If you have your copy of the Scriptures, you can follow along with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though for now, for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which through, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or what circumstances the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. These things have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you. By the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today I pray that you would speak to us through your word. You would use this time that we have together in your word to, Lord, to uh, shape us and mold us and form us into the people that you have called us to be. And not just the people you've called us to be, God, the people you have created us to be today. So Lord, I pray that the parts of me and the parts of us that we need to let go of, we would. We would loosen our grip and let you take them. Lord, the things that you want to grow in us, Lord, I pray that you would through your spirit. And that today's word, though, it may be difficult at times and it may be encouraging at times. God, I pray that we don't leave here without knowing that we have encountered you. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your cross. We thank you for your resurrection. For the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord stands forever. Amen. So God has saved you. If you're a follower of Christ, you've been saved by Christ, and you have been given a living hope. And there are some goals for you in salvation. So today, if you're a Christian, I want to express to you some of those goals. And so the first goal is this, if you're taking notes, it is to know Christ. To know Christ. When we go through life's most painful and difficult trials, knowing Jesus is the hope that sustains us. And and what Peter calls this knowing Jesus is loving Christ. Because it's more than just facts and it's more than just ideas. And as much as I love theology, knowing Christ is more than just theology. It is a relationship. And what does a relationship look like? I'm going to ask you a question real quick. Is God useful to you, or is God beautiful to you? Let me explain with a big mistake I made earlier this week. It's a bit of a confession time for just a second. Now, you just need to know that Allie cannot tell when I'm joking, and probably because I just, I don't, she says my tone doesn't change, it seems like I'm serious and all this kind of thing. Well, recently I made a joke that was so ridiculous, I thought that there was no way that she would be able to miss what I was saying and take me seriously, but I was wrong. After dinner, I was putting my plate away, and uh, I was going to put it into the dishwasher, and I pop open the dishwasher and pull out the uh, d- uh, drawer, and when I pull it out, I noticed that, oh, there's clean dishes in here. Oh, well, thinking to myself that the kids were going to come along later, because usually that's what happens. They unload the dishwasher. They're going to come along later. They unload the dishwasher. So I get my plate and my cup, and I set them in the sink. And the moment that plate and that cup hit the sink, Allie says, are you serious? You could 
unload the dishwasher and then put your plate in the dishwasher? And I replied, total joke, total joke. Babe, I married you to be my dishwasher. She didn't think that joke was as funny as I did. And she said, sometimes I feel like you married me when you could have just hired a maid. And I said, I have messed up, (laughs) y'all. I promptly unloaded the dishwasher and put my plate in and got out of there as quickly as I could. The reason that joke is so horrible and offensive is because if true, I had married Allie because she was useful to me but not beautiful to me. And we all recognize how bad that is. But I don't love Allie just because she is useful, although she, she does do amazing things around our home and does an amazing job keeping our home uh, organized and clean and, and everything else. But life with her is an end of itself, meaning that I love her because she is beautiful to me, both inside and out. Now, as offensive as that is to say about your spouse, and I heard the, the moans across the audience when I said it, there are some days when we, we don't think twice about treating God that way. And we follow him for what he can give to us. A ticket out of hell, wealth, um, health, uh, a good job, maybe a certain house that we want, or a particular car, or, you know, and as long as he keeps coming through, Jesus and I are tight with each other, but if I pray for something and he doesn't come through on that thing, or at least even doesn't come through in the timing that I want, I am tempted to question everything about him. Does he really love me? Is there really a God? And if that's how we end up treating God, God isn't beautiful to me. He's useful. But what we hear from Peter here is that the beauty of God Loving him is an end of itself. And Paul repeats this. The other great apostle of the early church repeats this in Philippians 3, 8 and 10. He says, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Everything else is loss. He's not just what he can give to me here on these 70 to 100 years that I have, but it is More than that, it is my relationship with God is an end of itself. And he continues, my goal, my end, my finish line, my prize is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Is God beautiful to you or is God useful to you? Is knowing him your goal, so much so that even in death, you, you, look, you look toward that day, that one day we will all go from this life to the next. And you think that even as hard as that seems and as scary as that seems in knowing Christ, I will know him better because I will have experienced death as he experienced death. But then I will also experience life as he experiences life. And so you know that no matter what you go through, life is about knowing God. So is God useful or beautiful to you? So the first goal of your salvation is to know Christ, and the second is to be like Christ. We see that God is refining and purifying us so that we can become like Jesus. And so there's three dimensions to our salvation as we uh, follow Christ. And this is what Peter points out to us. First dimension is this, justification. Justification or being justified means that we have been freed from the penalty of sin. This is a theological word, um, but a memory tool that you can remember when you hear about justification is just as if I never sinned. And so when Jesus goes to the cross, he dies on the cross in our place rather than us dying on the cross. And he takes on our sin, and when he dies, he pays the penalty for our sin— And then he takes it from us and we become just as if we had never sinned. We receive his righteousness. This is what Peter says in verse 3. He says, because of his great mercy, he has given us 
new birth. That new birth is that salvation, that justification. The has been shows that this is something that happened in the past on the cross. And our justification was purchased 2,000 years ago and is then transferred to you the moment you follow Christ. So by Jesus' work in the past on the cross, in your place, you were given a perfect record. So that's the first dimension of your salvation is justification. But the second dimension that we see here in 1 Peter 1 is glorification. This is a future event. So if justification was in the past, glorification is in the future. And it frees you from the presence of sin. Verse 5 tells us this. It says, to be revealed in the last time. So one day when we get to heaven, we will not have to deal with any sin at all. Not our own sin, not the sin of others. We won't struggle with envy. We won't struggle with pride, selfishness, hate, deceit, or jealousy. We will be freed from all of those things when we are glorified in heaven. Because we will finally be the people that we were created to be. And at our glorification, we will become like Christ. I can't wait for that day. (laughs) Fighting sin is a hard struggle. So, is glorification part of your hope in Christ? We often talk about, and, and rightfully so, every single week I get up here and talk about justification. How you can be saved, how you can know Christ, how you can be purified. But just as often and just as important is our glorification. It's not just what we are saved from, that we are saved from hell, but that we are saved to be like Christ one day. So in justification, we are freed from the penalty of sin. In glorification, we are freed from the presence of sin, but we are also free from the power of sin. And God will accomplish this through sanctification. So we got justification, and glorification, and sanctification. Justification's in the past, glorification's in the future, and sanctification is happening right now in your seat, sitting in this hot room. Jesus is sanctifying you and keeping you patient. (laughs) Sanctification happens now. It happens when you hear the word of God. It happens when you come to church. It happens when you're in a community group. It happens at your job. It happens with your family, with your kids, with your your spouse. It happens uh, with your, um, wherever you are, you are being sanctified by Christ. And it's a process that takes place over a lifetime to become the person that Christ created you to be. Because I can tell you this right now. I am not where I need to be yet. But I have been brought a long way by Christ up to this moment. And one day I look forward to where he is bringing me. It takes place over a lifetime, and it's not just up, you know, not just up and to the right. It is often a lot like this, and you go up and down and back and forth. But eventually, over a lifetime, you become more like Christ day by day. This is what 1 Peter says in verses 6 through 7. You rejoice in this even though for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials so that, you, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, your character and who you are, becoming like Christ, is being formed in life's trials. As James says, various trials, from your battery going dead to the worst thing that you can possibly think in life. God uses all those in your life to make you into the man or woman that he has called you to be. The fire and heat that he uses, like like a, a jeweler may Uh, refined metal, uh, a precious metal where the slag comes to the top. That's what God's doing. He's heating us up and the slag comes to the top and he skims it off the top. And so the failure of a business may make you reorient your priorities because you were spending too much time. You're spending uh, time away from uh, God, time away from family, time away from the things maybe that you should have really been and the business fails and all of a sudden you realize I had given too much of my life to that thing. I need to reorient it toward God. Or the crumbling of your marriage shatters your self-centeredness and your sense of self-sufficiency that you can do it yourself and you're good enough. And God uses that to say, hey, you're not good enough. None of us are. None of you are, but it's okay. And he brings you to himself in love. The pain that you feel in your body makes you realize how fragile life is and teaches you to value the things that really matter. 
If you keep dealing with a certain trial in your life, there's a sign that perhaps there's something in you that, that God wants you to deal with and take care of. Um, one thing I heard, I remember hearing uh, from my parents growing up, they said never pray for patience because the way God makes you patient is he sends you things to be patient about, and that is no fun. Now, of course, you need to pray for patience and being patient, but just realize that the way God makes you into the person he's going to be is by putting you through circumstances where you have to act out those fruits of the Spirit, right? So if you want to be a more loving person, just realize he's probably going to send some people into your life that are not so lovely, and you're going to have to learn to deal with them. That's what it looks like. That's what the fire looks like. Trials are God's way of purifying us and preparing us for a heaven, uh, our heavenly home before we're there. And so the question that every Christian should ask is, that's important is, am I going to be more like Christ tomorrow than I was today by the power of the Holy Spirit working in me? So first goal is, is to know Christ. Second is to be like Christ. And finally, third goal is to be with Christ. Christ. This is the going home of the exile. 1 Peter 1, 4. An inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Imperishable means that there is no expiration date. It cannot spoil. Undefiled means that it is pure. Unfading means it cannot rust away. It'll never turn to dust. It never gets boring. It's kept in heaven for you means that it is secure and can never be taken away. And your inheritance is preserved from disease, corruption. It is protected from market fluctuations and injustice in this world. It is protected by God. It's nice to know what our inheritance, it would be nice to know what our inheritance is though. So what is our inheritance? Now many of you know, one of my favorite movies of all time, or trilogy of movies of all, in, uh, of all time, is the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh, anybody remember those? Watch those? Uh, great. If you haven't watched them, do yourself a favor and watch them. They are some of the best movies ever made, and I think they're the best trilogy ever made, and that is coming from a massive Star Wars fan, so that is saying something. But in the books, when everything seems to be hopeless and, and uh, you know, Gandalf dies and all this stuff... He comes back to life, and there is Samwise Gamgee talking to him. And he, Samwise begins to sense that something is changing in the world, that the evil that has taken over the world is beginning to change, and, and good is beginning to win. And he says this, Is everything sad going to come untrue? And Gandalf and Samwise begin to laugh together. Because they realized that all the bad things in this world were beginning to unwind and become untrue. Tolkien was a committed Christian and was pointing to what Peter's talking about here. That there is an inheritance waiting for us where all the bad things, all the terrible things that we deal with in our life becomes untrue where we are united with lost family. There's no more disease. There's no more cancer. There's no more broken relationships. Our relationships with others are healed. There's no more pain. There's no more hate. There's no more tears of sadness. And one day, all the sad things will come untrue, and it will be perfect with our perfectly, perfect heavenly Father. And this is why Paul, who also as an exile, facing his execution as many of the early apostles did, can agree with the apostle Peter and say this, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so the Christian life is the ultimate win-win. If we live, we get to know Christ better, both in the good days when we can praise him and in the struggles and in the trials and in the fire, we get to know him better. We will even get to know him better when we die because we go through a new circumstance that we have not been through, that we go through with him. We even get to uh, know him uh, in everything that happens, but then eventually we will be in heaven and we will know him in a way we have never known him before. And so for the Christian to live is to know Christ and to die is to gain Christ. It's the ultimate win-win. In the Christian life, there is no downside. Even your pain has purpose and your death is gain. You have a great inheritance waiting for you. 
I want you for a moment to imagine that you have a rich uncle. And when I say rich, I mean like filthy rich, all right? And he gives you a massive inheritance, $10 million. It is absolutely life-changing. It is going to change everything about your circumstance. But there is one requirement, and it's, oh boy, the one requirement is that you travel 10 miles and get it from the bank. You're like, <laughs> yeah, I will travel 10 miles and go to the bank to get $10 million. But on your drive to the bank, your air conditioner goes out and it is 103 degrees and it is just miserable. Do you punch the steering wheel and pull off to the side of the road and give up? I'd be ridiculous. You say, no, there's $10 million. I'm going to roll down the windows and get to the bank. But then right a mile out from the bank, a tire blows and you're like, oh, could anything go worse today? And you get out the car and you go around and you look and there's no spare in the car. And there's your car. Blown tire, one mile away from the bank, $10 million waiting for you. Do you kick the tire, scream at the sky, and curse God? No. What you do is you then, in 103-degree weather, you skip the last mile to the bank because you know that there is $10 million waiting for you. And why doesn't it bother you? Because the struggles that you go through compared to the inheritance that you are waiting for or going to get aren't even that big of a deal. And that's what the believer's hope is like. The misfortunes of life begin to lose their sting because the eternal and infinitely beautiful inheritance that we have in Christ. So Christian, your pain has a purpose and even in death there is gain. And the inheritance that you have waiting for you can make all of life's circumstances not easy. It's going to be hard. I don't want to ever say that it's easy. But in comparison, you say, I can make it that extra mile because of what's waiting for me. Now today, if you're not a Christian, this imperishable inheritance that I'm speaking of can be available to you. Not by being better, not by trying harder, not by attending church more or praying more. It's available to you only through Christ and the work he did on the cross. This is the justification part that we talked about earlier. We've all done things that we're ashamed of. We've hurt people. We've hurt ourselves. Ultimately, we have hurt God's heart. And the Bible calls these things sin. And when God had every right to abandon us, The gap between us and God was infinitely long. There was no way that we could get across us, and God could have just turned around and said, oh, well, they messed up and left us. He could have left us to die, but instead of us dying, he sent his son to die for us. He died the death that we should have died and gave us the life that we don't deserve, and today he offers salvation to you. He offers this inheritance to you. And it says that if we trust that Jesus died on the cross and forgave our sins, which seems so strange to me. This simple? You mean I have to trust that Jesus died on the cross and forgave my sins? And that's that's it? It seems too, too simple. We want more to it. No, believe that Jesus saved you. And then follow him with your life. It says you will be saved and have an imperishable, eternal inheritance waiting for you. And that can be yours today. It can be something that just happens in you, in your heart. But perhaps um, there's a prayer that you can pray that says, Hey God, this is the moment, this is the day that I'm taking my life. I was going this direction. And I want to follow you. That can happen today. Pray with me. Everyone praying, no one looking around. In your heart, you can pray something along these lines. You can say, Jesus, today, forgive me of my sins. I do believe that you died on the cross for me and rose from the dead. Today, I'm trusting you with my life and my eternity. I give you my whole life and follow you today. In Jesus' name, amen. 
This media has been made available by Arbor Way Community Church in Boston, Massachusetts. At Arbor Way, we invite people to walk with Jesus together. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Arbor Way Community Church, or donate to this ministry, please visit arborwaychurch.com.